يا ذاكر الأصحاب كن متأدبا واعرف عظيم منازل الأصحاب هم صفوة رفعوا بصحبة أحمد وبذاك قد خصوا من الوهاب يا ذاكر الأصحاب كن متأدبا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد المبارك وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone إن شاء الله all of you are doing well in today's lecture we will be going over the life of Umar رضي الله تعالى عن he was one of the closest companions of the Prophet وسلم, and the second Khalifa of the Muslims. In, in today's world, you know, uh, it's important for us more than ever to look back to our real heroes instead of wasting time on anime and video games uh, because our heroes are real. You know, anime and video games are not real. Um, One Piece isn't real, Attack on Titan isn't real, Fortnite isn't real, Bob the Builder isn't real, but these heroes, they are real. And to become the best of Muslims, we need to look back and learn from them. We can debate on Attack on Titan, I'm just kidding. Uh, yes, so in today's lecture, we will be um, going over the life of the second Khalifa of the Muslims, Umar ibn al-Khattab an. And I won't be doing today's lecture. Our sister, if I, she will be doing it. Um, if you have not, I recommend that you see the previous lecture on Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an. It's on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can see it in the YouTube channel in the nitty-gritty stuff. So, yeah, uh, sister, you can take it from here. Okay. Okay, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. A'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina min yahdillahu fala mudillalahu wa min yudlil fala hadiyala So as Saad Bhai mentioned in his introduction that today's lecture is about Umar radiallahu an <coughs> I apologize I have a sore throat um, Okay so last lecture was about Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an and after him Undeniably, the most significant Sahabi is Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, right? And I'm sure uh, we've all heard his stories, um, stories of his exemplary character, you know, exemplary justice. Um, everything about him is amazing, right? He was the first man to be open about his Islam. And he was a Sahabi about him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, if there were to be a prophet after me, it would be Umar. What an honor, subhanAllah. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, There were in the nations before you people who were inspired. And if there is someone in my ummah who is inspired, he is Umar. Right? So, Today I'm going to present a brief biography uh, of Umar and we will also cover some stories uh, that will inspire us to better our characters inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us benefit from this session inshallah. Okay. Now his name, his name was Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nufail ibn Abdul Azza. He was born 13 years after the year of elephant. And also, guys, listen carefully. I'm going to ask a few questions at the end. Okay. He belonged to the Banu Adi clan from his father's side and Banu Makhzum on his mother's 
Right. So Banu uh, Banu Adi was not a major tribe. It was like a sub tribe, but they were responsible for arbitration among the tribes. Um, it was a common practice in the time of Jahiliya that whenever two chieftains would argue, they would bring in an arbitrator to decide who is higher in status. Right. The arbitrator is higher in status, and <coughs> these conflicts would sometimes last for months and. they required of the participants skills of eloquence and oration so that means umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu was an excellent orator and something that he inherited from his father and grandfather um according to ibn al-qayyim rahimahullah he was the safir of the quraysh the ambassador of the quraysh the quraysh would send him as an ambassador when someone called to them uh, to arbitrate among them or between them and others He was also a camel herder, a trader, horse rider, and a wrestler. I mean, uh, essentially, he was a camel herder, right? <coughs> also a trader. Um, he got into wrestling, you know, just to make some extra income. Um, something that you know oft mentioned in the narrations about his father is that he was a harsh man. and he would abuse uh, umar radhiyallahu an and you know exhaust him overwork him however umar radhiyallahu ta'ala an who did not let it get to him okay that is something we learned from him that the challenges or the <coughs> sufferings um or um the trauma that we go through it like we we should try our best to not let it get to us right and what he did instead was he was he was resilient in the face of all the torture and um abuse he suffered and he channeled it into serving the weak and uh, to establish justice and other righteous causes right he was big uh strong his complexion was ruddy except in the year of famine where it changed he had big deep set eyes and a deep voice that could be heard from far away i mean that's something you expect from someone who has a formidable personality and umar radhiyallahu ta'ala who certainly had that um another interesting thing about him uh, is that he learned to read and write at an early age so not many quraish during that time um you know it was not a common thing to learn to read and write all the poetry was um very common um he appreciated literature and poetry uh, although he was not a poet himself he was intelligent and full of wisdom okay now i'm going to mention something very interesting uh, i'm also going to refer to the voice chat uh, to see if you all have to say anything about it why do you think umar radhiyallahu ta'ala who opposed uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's message why did he uh, you know become like a wrench uh in the propagation of islam when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam started spreading his message uh, i'll see that later type your answers inshallah now okay i'm going to tell you actually his beef wasn't personal at all you know what he felt was the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's message was rupturing the society the unity of makkah you know it was causing discord and disunity between the tribes and uh, you know it ruptured the fabric of the makkan society itself and that's why umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu opposed the message of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was not because he was egotistical it was not because you know the message did not appeal to him he did not even know what the message was he only he could only see the consequences of the message right and now the, his conversion to islam uh, his story is very interesting and very inspiring Uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala was showing uh, Islam to Umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu in various stages right it did not happen like you know all at once he went, uh, he heard the message and he he like he proclaimed the shahada no okay so uh, when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was doing dawa there were many secret muslims right in makkah and there was uh, a couple um the woman abdullah uh, um abdullah um she narrated this incident to her son and she said um the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had ordered us to uh, migrate to abyssinia because the land was literally closing in on the makkans you know the people who had converted to islam the secret muslims they were being persecuted and tortured so they had no way out the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam therefore ordered them to move to abyssinia 
and she and her husband they would you know often get abused by Amr radiallahu anhu um so like they were ready just about to leave on their ride when Amr radiallahu anhu passed by and he said uh um abdullah are you leaving and she said yes we are leaving for you have harmed us and tortured us and we are leaving to a place um uh, to another place so that we can find solace there and we will return when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided a way for us you know everybody wants to be back to their land so she said that and you know umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was distraught there was something she saw on his face that she had never seen before um and umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said to her sahibakum allah may allah be with you the quraysh did believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right they were polytheists so they believed in allah but along like they did shirk um along with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they uh, worshiped idols as well so when um um abdullah's husband who had gone out to get something um <clears throat> when he returned she said to him um umar came and i saw on his face a softness that i had never seen before he is probably grieved because of our leaving um now her husband being a man he said uh you think he is going to accept the message of islam and uh, um abdullah said yes i believe that he would become a muslim inshallah and um her husband said the man you saw won't accept islam till the donkey of al khattab has accepted islam it's like he he meant like there is no chance you know you are you're fooling yourself there is no chance and that was that now um by this time umar radiyallahu an brother zaid ibn al khattab and his sister fatima ibn al ibn al khattab they had embraced islam and they were secret muslims and zaid ibn al khattab uh, you know much is not known about him except that he was a secret muslim and that he got martyred in the battle of yamama um Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu uh, on the day uh, of the battle uh, on the day of Yamama he accompanied his brother obviously he was among the muslims and he said uh, oh zaid you have surpassed me in two things in embracing islam and uh, and in embracing shahada that that is martyrdom okay so he had a very quiet personality zaid radiyallahu anhu um now um another incident that you know um kind of led to an awakening in umar radiyallahu an is this one night uh, umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu came to the kaaba and he saw the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was praying right so um he thought i'll just go and do tawaf uh, so he entered the kaaba from the opposite side and he st- uh, like he hid himself uh, uh under the cloth of the kaaba that is the thiyab and he started doing tawaf and there there came a moment when um the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was right before umar radiyallahu an and um there was nothing between them except the thiyab the cloth of the kaaba and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was reciting surah al haqqa um when uh, umar radiyallahu ta'ala an who heard the uh, heard the recitation of the quran he proclaimed subhanallah i've never heard anything more beautiful than this you know because he was someone who knew literature and poetry i mean you 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 need to have a certain acumen to appreciate that kind of thing right and he did although quran is not poetry um so uh, umar you know like as soon as he you know was thinking how amazing this these verses are uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he you know thought to himself i'm sure the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a poet and then um The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam read the verse innahu laqawlu rasulin kareem that indeed the Quran is the word of a noble messenger and the next verse wa ma huwa bi qawli shair qalilan ma tu'minun and it is not the word of a poet little do you believe you know it was like uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam could almost read umar radiyallahu ta'ala in his mind and next thing he thinks is that oh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a soothsayer or a sorcerer because he knows exactly what i'm thinking and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recited the following verse wala bi qawli kahin qalilan ma tadhakkarun 
nor the word of a soothsayer little do you remember and this was you know so shocking for him he i mean just think of, of this for a moment you know if something like that were to happen to us i mean our, we would feel uh, we would feel uncomfortable and unsettled you know to say the least and he was confused and conflicted um naturally then he went out Uh, Abu Jahl was addressing the leaders of the Quraysh and he asked who will kill the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam naudu billah uh he is caused disruption and insults our idols and whoever does this will get 100 red camels uh, so red camel would be like the equivalent of the best car you could imagine you know uh and all the gold and silver and Umar radhiyallahu anhu not for the reward but because he was so conflicted he just wanted to you know do something about it just you know like get it like he just wanted to get done with it so he said i'm going to do it and he set out in anger and frustration he was hurling abuse at the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said i'm going to make makka go back to where it was and umar radhi allah ta'ala anhu he himself you know in various narrations he said i was the most severe of the people to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um and then he when he set out to naudu billah kill the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he met a man from banu adi um he his name was nuaim ibn abdullah who was a secret muslim okay and the umar radhiyallahu anhu has uh, like he had a sword sword in his hand like he was all set and no i am uh, you know he thought something was wrong and he asked umar where he was going and umar radhiyallahu anhu said i am going to kill the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and no i am radhiyallahu anhu was a secret muslim right so he wanted to save the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, he wanted to buy time and you know distract and divert umar radhiyallahu anhu's attention so what he did was um he asked him if you do that do you think banu abdul manaf would uh, forgive you um because he is al amin and as sadiq you know because even though the quraish did not like the message he was the most trustworthy right then umar radhi allah ta'ala anhu uh, you know sensed that uh, on noaim is probably a muslim or something that's why he is uh, saying all this and he said have you apostated you know for him apostasy would be the opposite of what apostasy is to us and on noaim said no uh, it's nothing like that and then um, uh, he said if it is like that i'm going to kill you first and then i'm going i'm going to do the rest so no i am billah one at this point he said you're worrying about me when islam has entered your own house and now umar radhiyallahu anhu mm-hmm. was extremely angry he was indignant and he said uh, no i am billah tan anhu said your sister and your brother in law have become muslim so take care of your own home before doing any of this Now Umar radhiyallahu anhu immediately without giving it thought giving it any thought he set out to his sister's place and he struck the door uh, and um, you know he could hear something being read uh, and then the uh, Fatima bin al- bint al-Khattab and her husband Sa'id bin Zaid they were uh, reading the Quran with uh, Khabbab ibn al-Awad radhiyallahu anhu so khabbab ibn al-awad would be like he belonged to the weaker section of the quraish right he was one of the most oppressed uh, and tortured and persecuted people so what they did was they tried to hide the mushaf and khabbab radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu had to hide himself otherwise umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu would have killed him without any thought and he could have gotten like away with it because he was umar right so he hid himself and you know in like because they were in a rush they uh, forgot to hide a page of the mushaf so it was like it it got left there and they could see uh, they could see it i mean they could not see but umar radhiyallahu anhu when he entered later on he could see so uh, fatima opened the door and um then he asked them have you all apostated then said bin uh, zaid who was fatima's husband he said what if truth lies outside your religion umar and umar radhiyallahu anhu started hitting him hard because he was so mad um and then he was like literally striking blows on his chest and said bin zaid was 
you know panting on the floor below then his sister tried to stop him and he struck her in the front right because he 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 wanted to go on he was so angry then he struck her and she started bleeding and she she also got infuriated and she said you know what uh, do whatever you want to do to us we are not going to uh, you know we are going to remain steadfast you you can do nothing about this when he saw her uh, when he saw her bleeding uh, he softened a little bit and he felt ashamed and um, he asked uh, and her sister like uh, his sister also said to him you can't gather people on false hope that was something that you know got to him and umar radhiyallahu anhu and who asked his sister to show him the sahifa they were reading and she said you are not one of the pure only those who are pure can read it um and then he said i just want to read i want to know what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam teaches so uh his sister insisted that he needed to uh, purify himself and then he bathed himself and uh, sat down and he re- he the sahifa uh, had surah taha on it and he started reading and he read till verse 20 right so verse 20 of surah uh, sorry verse 14 um of surah taha uh, and verse 14 is inna ni nallah la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqimi as-salata li dhikri um indeed i am allah your lord right uh and then when he read this umar radhiyallahu anhu said this ilah deserves to be worshiped alone is this what the quraish are running away from you know that was this was the moment when islam had truly awakened in umar radhiyallahu anhu he wanted to see the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam next and this was the time when khabab ibn al-awad radhiyallahu an he came out uh, of the hiding and he said glad tidings to you o umar and i hope the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's dua had been accepted in your favor uh, he made dua that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant victory to islam but the one more beloved to him of the two men that is umar radhiyallahu an and abu jahl Umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu was pleasantly surprised and he said uh, uh, he in his like he would narrate later on that in that moment nobody on the planet was more beloved to him than the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he asked uh, khabab ibn al-awad the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did did he really say that and khabab radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu said yes he did say that and he wanted to see the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, his sister made him uh, promise that he means absolutely no harm to the believers and amar ul ladan who you know said yes i don't and then khabab ul ladan who took him to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was at dar al arqam uh, along with other believers okay now another interesting thing that had happened very recently uh, just 3 days ago was Hamza radiyallahu ta'ala who had accepted Islam and you know his Islam was uh, really it flipped things upside down because the Muslims who were weak up until now they had become strong right so um when Umar radiyallahu ta'ala who he still had the sword in his hand by the way um uh, so when he went to the door and knocked Uh, a man saw him through the peephole and he informed everyone he was he was panicked the man was ext- like he got really scared because umar radhiyallahu anhu who had a formidable personality he would you know really be harsh towards the muslims this person you know went and informed everybody hada umar it's it's umar and hamza radhiyallahu anhu said if he's come and sees good for him and if not killing him wouldn't be a difficult thing right because um, uh, hamza radhiyallahu anhu is as strong and formidable as umar was in that sense and umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu is shown inside and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he grabs him by his arms and he brings him down on his knees and he says will you stop only when a calamity strikes from heaven o umar and umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu said o messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam i witness that there is no god but allah you are the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and people like everybody inside the room was you know overjoyed they absolutely rejoiced uh, in umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu's proclamation of islam now this was when he received the title 
the title was given to him by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu uh, you know in uh, various narrations says i pronounce the shahada and the other people of the house said allahu akbar in such a way that the people of makkah heard it and i said o oh, messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are we not upon the truth and uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said of course we are and i said why do we conceal it then you know because umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he felt uncomfortable hiding the truth you know this is something that truth demands of us that we be absolutely open and transparent about it you know and ob- obviously it requires courage as well which umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu certainly had and we went out uh, this is umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu saying right we they like we went out in two ranks in one of which uh, uh, umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu is there and in, in the uh, other uh, hamza radhiyallahu anhu and the quraish looked at uh, hamza radhiyallahu anhu and umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu and they became like visibly scared because hamza and umar they were like the two um, giants and the quraish did not have any you know like they did not have the guts to touch the believers then the messenger of sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, named him uh, farooq on that day farooq means the one who arbitrates between truth and falsehood now about his emigration okay so up until now everybody that uh, migrated they would migrate in secret uh, they would not let their migration known because the quraish would obviously create problems you know and you know they would like do everything they could to stop people from migrating ibn asakir narrates that ali radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu said um, i don't know of anyone who didn't emigrate in secret except for umar ibn al khattab because when he wanted to migrate he strapped on his sword put his bow over his shoulder carried his arrows in his hand and came to the kaaba where the nobles of the quraish were sitting in the courtyard he performed tawaf and then prayed two rakats at maqam ibrahim and then he approached their circle one step at a time and said you know just imagine like he is uh, climbing the stairs and he said what ugly faces um this this i find this amazing okay like this is kind of uh, you know teens would say swag but this is i love this kind of bravado okay he's like what ugly faces and he says whoever wishes to bereave his mother orphan his children and widow his wife then let him meet me behind this valley and like not one of the quraish followed him subhanallah <laughs> so he did really have that you know strong and formidable personality now about his merit um ibn umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu uh, narrates that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah has put the truth upon umar's tongue in his in his heart and ibn umar radhiyallahu anhu said no affair ever happened among people and they spoke about it and umar spoke about it and the quran was revealed confirming what umar said in another okay i already mentioned this right the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said if there were to be a prophet after me it would be umar ibn al umar ibn khattab let's see what abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu has to say about umar radhiyallahu anhu he said there is not on the face of the earth a man more beloved to me than umar and someone said to abu bakr during his last illness what will you say to your lord when you have appointed umar he said i will say to him I have appointed over them the best of them. Okay. Now we'll talk about uh, his caliphate and uh, his title Amir al-Mu'minin. Uh, so according to Al-Duhri, uh, uh, Umar radhiyallahu ta'ala who was appointed khalifa on the day uh, that Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu passed away, which was Tuesday 8 days before the end of Jumaat al-Akhira and Umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu took it with you know full conviction and uh, there were uh, as we know many openings in his days okay so uh, how he received the title Amir al-Mu'minin so uh, until the time of uh, uh, Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu 
he would be known as the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Umar radiallahu anhu became Khalifa, the people insisted that they uh, that he be called the Khalifa of the Khalifa of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Umar radiallahu anhu uh, said that's too long. Uh, the people said, but um, we have appointed you as our Amir, uh, so you are our Amir. And he said, okay, you are the believers and I am your Amir. So like that's how he came to be called as the Amir al-Mu'mineen. Um, he has narrated uh, 539 ahadith from the Prophet wasallam. Now listen to all the achievements and you know the things he pioneered because there are so many things that he um, pioneered in his times, like things that were never done before. So he was the first person to be called Amir al-Mu'mineen, the first to date events from the Hijra. So the Hijra calendar that we refer to today, he was the one to date events from there. The first to take Baitul Mal. Baitul Mal is basically a welfare state, right? That aided Muslim and non-Muslim, poor, needy, elderly, orphans, widows, and the disabled. He also introduced child benefit or pensions for children and the elderly. The first to establish as a sunnah the standing for the prayer, prayer in the month of Ramadan that we know as Tarawih. The first who patrolled at night. So this is very this is something you know known about him that he would patrol at night. Uh, and you know look for people who are you know uh, suffering or if they may need anything you know to cater to the needs of the people because he was their Amir right he was their leader and he would be held accountable that was how much he feared uh, being accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he set the bar really high he was the first who punished satire the first who punished wine drinking with 80 lashes. The first to forbid the sale of female slaves who had borne children to their masters. The first to assemble for prayers over the dead with four takbirs. The first to have a register. The first to make conquests. The first to convey food from Egypt upon the Isla Sea uh, to Medina. The first who dedicated sadaqah purely for the sake of Allah in Islam. The first to take the zakat of horses. The first to say, may Allah lengthen your life, uh, he said it to Ali an, and the first to say, may Allah help you, he said this to Ali as well. This is what al Kari mentions. Um, he was the first to appoint Qadis in the provinces, right? He established provinces of Kufa, Basra, Mesopotamia, Syria, Cairo and Mosul. Okay, uh, Ibn Asakir also mentioned this that Ali Wabillahwan passed by the mosques in Ramadan and he said uh, there were lamps in the mosque. So he said, May Allah illuminate Omar in his grave as he has illuminated our mosques for us. So he was the he was the one to, you know, light the mosques by putting lamps there. He allowed the Jews to settle in Jerusalem, something that had been denied to them. You know, uh, and interestingly, the golden age of um, the Jewish uh, history or I don't know the golden age of the Jews was under the Islamic rule I don't know if it's like it's common knowledge or not but just wanted to mention that he also ordered that the Jews and Christians be treated well and granted them land equivalent to theirs in the new settlement he was the first person to codify the Islamic law the founder of fiqh okay um, so now his life as a caliph you know, contrary to how we would imagine uh, a caliph or a leader would lead his life, Amar al-Dilatanahu's life was, you know, far away from what we could imagine. He was very careful about the poor and needy living under him. He would refrain from all sorts of luxury, uh, you know, you'd expect a leader to take part in. So when we think of rulers in general, like, um, and leaders in, like, in modern terminology, uh, we think of someone who wears fancy clothes, eats great food, and lives in a big castle, right? But this was not Amar al-Dillahwan who was. He knew that if there was a single person who went hungry and he was the head of the state, he would be questioned by Allah. And, you know, he had, he, he led a very ascetic life. Like, he 
um, only took whatever he needed, you know, no more. I, I mean, he could because he was a leader, but he never did that. Okay, now his salary. Uh, I, yeah, like the following things I'm gonna mention would be, you know, the, uh, they would be examples of how Marudala Khan he lived his life as a caliph. So his salary. Salim ibn Abdullah reports that when Umar an became the Khalifa, he took the same allowance that was fixed for Abu Bakr Siddiq I mean, he continued because uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq had taken that much amount of money, but you know, it became difficult for him to fulfill his needs with it. And the companions, his uh, companions like Uthman, Ali, uh, and you know, the, the ones who were very close to him, they saw that and they uh, suggested that Amar who increases allowance but of Amar who said this is Omar we are talking about so we need to be very careful like if we go and tell him that um, you know you increase your allowance uh, Amar who might get you know um, infuriated so uh, they decided that they would send Amar and his daughter uh, Hafsa anha, who is also uh, um, uh, Ummul Mu'mineen, right? She is also one of the mother of the believers. Anha. They asked her, and uh, she was also asked to not uh, disclose the names of the companions who had suggested this, which is interesting, you know. Then she went to Amar uh, and she uh, told him that, you know, uh, Father, please increase your allowance. Uh, and Omar Dilatan, who, as expected, he got angry, and he wanted to know who had suggested that. Then he asked her about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like how he lived his life, uh, what the best clothing uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore was, the f- best food he ate, and the most comfortable bedding he used. For best clothing, she replied, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam two reddish brown garments which he wore when receiving delegations and delivering sermons on Friday. And for the food, she said, she once made bread from barley flour, and while it was hot, she poured some leftover oil from the bottom of the can to make it soft. And then he ate it with relish. And, okay, like, this is not the the kind of soft that we imagine. Our breads are extremely fluffy and soft. This, this, this is not the kind of bread we are talking about. So wanted to mention that for food uh, okay now about the bedding Hafsa Hanha said it was made from a thick material which they four folded in summer beneath them you know so that the floor would be like a little bit soft on them because in summer um, they could like they did not need the bedding to fold it right and during winter they would double fold it beneath them to use the other portion to cover themselves now, Amar uh, Anhu asked her uh, to take his message to those companions who had suggested that he increase his allowance, that the Prophet ﷺ was their example for everything. And the Prophet ﷺ kept luxury in its place without indulging in it and sufficed only with what was necessary. And he would also do the same. Then he said, the examples of myself and my two companions, Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr, are like three persons on a road. The first took along his provisions and reached his destination. That is the Prophet The second followed suit and also reached the destination. Uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq Now the third is on the road. If he sticks to their way and is content with the provisions they took, he will meet them and be with them. However, if he takes a road other than the one they took, he will not be able to meet up with them. Um, it's reported that the daily allowance of Amar uh, from the Baitul Mal for his and his family's needs were, uh, was only two dirhams. Can you imagine? Like, just two dirhams. He would only take food from Baitul Mal that was absolutely necessary for his family and himself. He would also receive clothes, and if his current clothes tore before, then he would patch them. Now about his eating habits. Amar who refrained from eating fancy and luxurious foods. And there are, this is mentioned in you know, many narrations. Uh, the, the, the hadith uh, or the, the, the incident I'm going to quote right now is very important, so listen to this very carefully. 
हमारे दिल आता हूँ वन से राइव इन सीरिया एंड ही सॉ फूड वी एड नेवर सीन बिफोर ही आस वाई वी ईट दिस वट विल द पोअर मुस्लिम्स हैव डाइट विदाउट फिलिंग दमसेल्व विद इवन बाली ब्रेड ईट वट डिड दे ईट यू नो विदाउट लाइक दे वेंट हंगली बेसिकली एंड समन रिप्लाई दे शेल हैव जनना अमर उदी लानू स्टार्टिंग चाइंग ही सेड इफ दिस फूड इज आर शेयर वाई दे हैव मेड ऑफ द जनना देन दे हैव सर्टनली एक्सेल्ड अस विद अ ट्रमेंडस वर्चू Hafsa رضي الله تعالى عنه عنها once served him cold gravy and bread. Uh, she then poured some oil into it. Uh, he replied, two gravies in one. Then he said, I shall not eat this until the day I meet Allah. So imagine the simplicity, uh, the kind of life that Amr رضي الله تعالى عنه led. Now about his clothing. Amr رضي الله تعالى عنه would wear the same clothes. and if they ever told he would patch them you know this is one of the ways of the salaf like that's um, often been mentioned not all of them but most of them i've heard you know they would patch their clothes and i'm not really sure if you do that today it it would be i mean, people would like probably i like what to size you would not even be like probably to enter society is that the kind of extravagance you become used to Um, once Hassan رضي الله تعالى عنه reported that when Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه was a Khalifa in delivering a lecture, he was wearing a lower gar- garment that had twelve patches. Imagine twelve patches. Anas رضي الله تعالى عنه reported he once saw that his garments had three patches between the shoulders, one overlapping on the other. <coughs> okay, now when Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه would walk through the market. uh it was reported that he wore a pitched woolen robe that had some patches of leather and he was used to walk with a whip on his shoulder to discipline trouble making people so even while he is you know um walking the markets he is taking care of his people that that was like that was the extent of his concern for his people and whenever he passed by any fred or dates Dead stones lying around. He picked them up and threw them in people's yards so that they may find use for them. Okay. Um. This. Okay. I wanted to quote something, but it 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 would like it would come in this narration. So, um. Yeah. Listen carefully to this. Travel to Syria incident. I confuse the other incident with this one. So, Farid Abin Shihab reported that Amr Abdul Latif Al Anhu. left on a journey to Syria with Abu Ubaidah radiyallahu anhu and they came upon a creek which they needed to cross Amr radiyallahu anhu you know dismounted from his camel took off his sandals and uh, placed them over his shoulders and led the camel through the creek himself uh, mind you he is the amir al-mu'minin right he could have asked somebody else to do this to to do all of that for him but he did everything by himself and seeing the khalifa of the muslims in this state abu ubaidah radiyallahu anhu felt saddened and said o commander of the faithful are you doing this you have taken off your sandals and placed them on your back and you let the camel through the creek yourself i do not think it will be easy for me and i fear the people of this country will think of you without honor so umar radiyallahu anhu what he said on this occasion is historical and is extremely inspiring Umar radiyallahu anhu said if only someone else with less knowledge than you had said this o abu ubaida i would have made this a deterrent for the nation of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam verily before islam we were a disgraceful people and allah honored us with islam so if we ever seek honor from anything else other than islam then allah will humiliate and disgrace us once again subhanallah so he, you know that was the level of his taqwa uh, of his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his deen and his love for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his sunnah right everything the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did they wanted to imitate that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam lived a uh, very simple you know like they could barely meet uh, they could barely you know let the ends meet but for them what was important was their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right islam came first to them and other worldly things were secondary and they treated them as such right Now I'm going to share uh, what some of the non-Muslims have to say about Amal. Um 
so in 1937 uh, congress established congress established government in india right congress like had already been established in 1880 something but in india it got established in 1937 gandhi was the leader of the congress and while advising his cabinet to lead a simple life he said i cannot give you an example of ram chandra or krishan because they are not historical figures they were probably i think uh, is gandhi's contemporaries I am forced to give you an example of Abu Bakr and Omar Farooq when it comes to simplicity. They were the rulers of a great country but still led simple lives. So the thing is uh you know when you put Islam first and you know um Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala first Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala makes everything in a way bow down to you right because ev- everything is controlled by Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. and the time journalist michael hart cited umar umar ibn khattab as the 52nd most influential man i'm sure you guys have heard of michael hart right he compiled this book called uh, the the 100 most influential people i guess or persons and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stands number 1 among those 100 people and umar ibn khattab is on the 52nd rank uh, and according to michael hart he was um, one of the most influential men to have ever lived and this is one historian william moore wrote about amr who said amr began his reign master only of arabia so he started with arabia you know like the humble beginnings he died the caliph of an entire um, uh, of an empire embracing some of the fairest provinces under byzantine rule and with persia to boot so he had both byzantine and persia so you know like uh Byzantine and Persia would be like titans uh, or like the superpowers of that time yet throughout this marvelous fortune he never lost the balance of a wise and sober judgment nor exalted himself above the frugal habit of the arab chief so umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu did not have any delusions of grandeur um although he was he was the leader of the believers he you know made conquests expanded his uh, his empire you know you know like and that was far reaching but he obviously uh, he ob- always always kept allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and you know never forgot you know where he came from and where all of us come from right now about his martyrdom amr bin maimun said uh when he was stabbed that is when amr radhiyallahu anhu was stabbed i was standing there and there was nobody except abdullah bin abbas so amr radhiyallahu anhu had this habit uh whenever he would you know see people standing in rows he would ask people to straighten up the rows right while praying the fajr um the day uh uh he got stabbed as soon as he said takbir i heard him saying the dog has eaten me you know he got stabbed and in you know anguish and pain he said the dog has eaten me he was referring to the non arab infidel uh that kept stab- stabbing people right and left you know he was a slave of okay i it will like i'll tell you later on who he was and he stabbed 13 people seven out of which died and a muslim was you know he saw uh, the the slave attacking people and he you know threw a cloak on him and the slave he thought that he got captured and you know uh, and he got scared and he killed himself umar radhiyallahu anhu held the hand of abdul rahman bin auf radhiyallahu anhu and asked him to lead the prayer uh, abdul rahman bin auf you know led a short prayer and then umar radhiyallahu anhu was brought home um then umar radhiyallahu anhu uh, asked uh, you know who is my murderer and the people told him that it was firoz uh, and he asked the slave uh, uh, firoz the slave of uh, the slave of al mughira and he asked the the craftsman and people said yes umar radhiyallahu anhu said alhamdulillah the allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not let me die at the hands of a man who claims himself to be a muslim he was happy that you know he got uh, stabbed by someone who is not a muslim and then people were distraught because the wound was severe um people gave him nabi and uh, but like the wound was uh, like so big uh, the whatever he was given the liquid that came uh, the fluid came out of his belly 
and then he was given milk and the milk came out of his belly as well and people were like people knew that he was not going to make it then amr al adan who called his son abdullah and asked him to check all his debts and clear them and if the family falls short of it and then uh, uh, if it does not suffice them then ask the quraish um okay so okay so he asked uh, asked his son to clear the debts and he says if you fall short of the money uh, give me a sec guys and if they fall short then they should ask bani ali ibn kaab and if that does not suffice then ask the quraish and no one else it was also a matter of you know who they could borrow money from then he asked him to go to aisha radhiyallahu an and he asked him to say to her that umar pays uh, his salutations to you and he asked his son to not say uh, amirul mu'minin uh, because i am not your amirul mu'minin today and you ask her uh, uh, on my behalf and say to her that umar ibn al-khattab asks for the permission to be buried with his other two companions abdullah left from mother aisha's place she was sitting and weeping abdullah greeted aisha and he said to her that umar my father pays his salutations to you and he asks uh, to be buried with his two companions aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha says Uh, I had the idea of uh, having the place to myself but today I prefer Umar to myself. So you know this is a sacrifice on the part of Ummul Mukminin Aisha radhiyallahu anha. She is uh, she is a mother and this is like a huge sacrifice if you think about it because the two persons uh, Umar was asking to be buried with was her husband and her father right? And it's obviously not an easy thing to let go of that. Uh but she did. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. Then uh, Abdullah bin Umar came back to Umar radhiyallahu anhu and he asked to be sat up and he asked him uh, what news he had and he said um, it is as you asked it is as you wished you know meaning she has given the permission Then Umar radhiyallahu anhu uh, said to him again that when i die uh, take me to Aisha greet her and say umar asks for the permission to be buried with his two companions now why did he say it twice it's because you know when he was alive aisha radhiyallahu anha could have you know she she said yes but you know after that maybe she could change her mind and it was important to umar radhiyallahu anhu and he was so cognizant of the fact that she could change her mind he he wanted to you know make sure that you know uh, it's not because he was alive that she said yes even after he is gone he wants to make sure that you know she is giving uh, uh, like this place uh, will willingly and then uh, when amar ud-din who uh, passed away um, she he was taken to aisha and she uh, asked like asked the people to you know bring him in and then he was brought in and he was he's buried with the two uh, companions that is uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu anhu okay now another matter that needed to be settled uh, by amar radhiyallahu anhu was who would be the next khalifa right so uh, amar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu uh, made his son a witness and he shortlisted six companions they were ali uthman talha zubair saad and abdul rahman bin auf and he also uh, made uh, sure to tell people that his son will not have any share in the rule right he told them that if they ever needed any assistance abdullah would help them but he will have no share in the rule whatsoever Then he asked them to take care of immigrants rights the poor the anfar as faith entered their hearts before them that is the muhajirin he asked them to take care of the mees among many other things okay and you know after that abdul rahman bin auf um made uthman radhiyallahu anhu the khalifa you know with the consent of ali radhiyallahu anhu and uh, the other um four companions he made Uthman radhiyallahu anhu the khalifa so we come to the end of the session alhamdulillah
um, I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah, uh, Jazakallah khair everyone for joining. May Allah reward all of you for attending this lecture. Um, may you allow us to follow the footsteps of the companions. Radi Allahu ta'ala anhum. Allahum aizu islam wal muslimin. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala akhari kalki muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatiki ya rahman rahimin.